Um, hello, everybody. I, I think everyone should be admitted at this point. Um, my name is Matthew Cooper. I'm the president of the um, Columbia University Club of Philadelphia. Um, I'm joined tonight by Terry Kung, who is the president of the Brooklyn Club, and we're pleased to invite you. We apologize for the delay technical on our end um, for an exciting program. We're going to have the speakers introduce themselves now and jump right into it. Um, the, speak, the three speakers from the Columbia Career Coaches Network. Mm -hmm. So without further ado, here they are. Mike? Sure, I'll go first. Um, can everybody still hear me? Can I just get at least one thumbs up? Okay, fantastic. Um, my name is Mike Middleman, um, Columbia Business 93, also Penn 88. So that's why I'm excited about talking to both of my halves. Um, so to speak. Um, I'm a career coach. I help everybody from what do I do with my life all the way through to the uh, interview process um, and everything in between. Um, most of my clients are between college age and uh, 60. And I tend to focus mostly on financial services because I have a Wall Street background um, and also focus a lot on IT um, clients. So uh, that's my general demographics. I love being a career coach. I, um, I was in the corporate world for so many years and didn't find it remotely uh, spiritually satisfying, but helping people is actually really important to me now. So I'm happy to be my own boss. Josh? Hi, I'm Joshua Spodek. And I was born in Philadelphia in 1971 and uh, grew up in Mount Airy in Germantown, went to Central High School and Masterman before that. Uh, then went to Columbia undergrad, started grad school at Penn, transferred back to Columbia. So a lot of Philly, uh, Columbia stuff. Uh, got my PhD at uh, Columbia in physics. And then a couple of years after, then started my first startup. And then um, uh, went back to get my MBA at Columbia. I've since written a couple of books on initiative and leadership. I teach leadership at NYU. I host the Leadership and the Environment podcast, which is now changing to, I live across the street from a firehouse in case anyone can hear the noise behind me. Sorry about that. Uh, and they test their equipment. Um, I tend to coach people who are upper executives on the C-suite borderline into or just uh, reaching there and also a fair number of entrepreneurs. Um, I'll leave it at that for now. If people have questions more, let me know. I assume I'm next since uh, <laughs> one, two, three. Um, I'm a born and bred New Yorker who never thought she would leave uh, and I'm now technically living in Colorado, although at the moment I am in, I had, we took our first road trip since we are both inoculated and we are now in Santa Fe uh, feeling very fortunate and very lucky uh, to have family here who had an extra house. And uh, it's fun to have, to see people uh, in a different way other than at Zoom. Um, I'm known as an international career counselor. I work with the whole pers person. I am both a certified career counselor and the president of the, uh, I was president of the Career Counselors Consortium. I've been on the board of the Harvard Divinity School, Women's Studies and Religion. And I've been on the board of the, I helped found the American Art Therapy Association. I was originally an art therapist uh, one of the first on the planet until I transferred. Um, a friend of mine was teaching fine art students who didn't know how they would possibly support themselves. So she asked me if I would go and talk about art therapy. And I did that. And then she said, well, talk about your husband's career. He's a New Yorker cartoonist. Everybody's always interested in that. And then my friend, the graphic artist. So once a week in between nursing my daughter, which is what I was really doing in that moment, um, the Dean at Parsons School of Design called me and asked me if I would, what I was doing, uh, something about art therapy, because I was very visible and I was on the board there too. And um, he said, well, what are you doing now? And so I brilliantly said, I'm giving uh, lectures on careers in the arts. And he said, really, no one's ever done that before. Would you look, come and do a course at Parsons? And I said, yes, I would love to. <laughs> and created a course using doing a lot of research about careers and why people are happy and unhappy and want to change and do what they do better. 
Um, and I created a course and I said, I also have to do a course in art therapy because my identity was so strong. But then I got much more interested in the career area. And so I am, a, uh, I am an example of a person who followed her interests. I got interested in actually making art at Columbia, which is fairly unusual. <laughs> but I met this great teacher and I started making art. Um, and so I had to figure out a way of incorporating that. And I was an editor of a newspaper. I mean, I've had lots of careers and they've integrated my curiosity, my interest and my compassion. And um, I generally deal with intelligent people who wanna make a difference either in their field, in their organization or in the world. And I look forward to answering all the wonderful questions that you sent us, thank you. Well, thank you, um, Judith, Josh, and Mike for just even sharing your own personal backgrounds. It's so fascinating. And it is always, you know, when we listen to other people's stories of how they transition from one thing to another, I think, um, Judith, you hit it right on the nail on the head in terms of following personal passions and, um, you know, doing good and whatever your personal motives are. So I am interested in, um, I think many of us are interested in hearing from all three of you. Um, what are some of the things that people, how to transition in and out of things, how to follow those things that are in your heart, but you're kind of stuck in a, um, you know, a career path. And if whether you want to move in a different direction or completely out of that area, what are some of the recommendations um, you may have? Well, I think that the idea of, it's really, the idea that if you've been doing this for a long time, you can't switch. It's a very difficult thing to do. I think it's past. I think people look at what you can offer and, um, even gaps on, it used to be like if you have more than a year gap on a resume, it was a big problem. And that, I think people expect that. It's what can you bring to us? Do I like working with you? When I meet with you, do you seem like someone I can work with? If you want to switch to something new, I think a lot of people think, oh, I'll send out some resumes into a new area and maybe uh, do some informational interviews. I find my clients have great success in doing something that adds value to the community that you want to go into. It could be something doing like a webinar like this. It could be uh, writing a piece for a paper about something. Um, it can be hosting a podcast if you really want to go full into it. When you show value for a community that you want to go into and you are adding value to that community, then people see that you are adding value, that you, they want you to be a part of that community. If, if I'm someone in a community and someone's making my life better, I want that person to be more in my community. I want to share my resources with them. So I strongly recommend not just researching, but acting in a community, volunteering if that's all there is available to you, but there's a, generally something, but something where you interact with other people and show that you're bringing value to that community. It generally doesn't take much time and it doesn't necessarily take much cost, uh, and, or it can take as much time and cost as you want, but you want to make connections and to show that you care, that you're adding value, that, mm. you, that you solve problems. Mm. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I always feel when we're on these panels and we get all these wonderful questions that the actual answer is, it depends. So some of it is, it depends on where you are, what's your situation, uh, you know, what uh, are you good at forming relationships? So do you need coaching and forming relationships? Uh, do you have a network that you haven't activated? Uh, and what skills do you already have that you have to share? And I totally agree that the idea of doing uh, volunteer work um, or and volunteering for something you care about. I've found over the years that I've often, you know, I was an early, you know, early in the women's movement and those people that I shared that caring about are always and are lifelong parts of my life. And they always, one thing always leads to another. So it's really not, uh, it's really developing your courage to offer something uh, and to take a good look at yourself. What are your technical skills? Obviously right now, everyone needs technical skills. I mean, 
<laughs> I have two grandchildren who are my coaches and anything that I get stuck with technically because they breathe it. It's their natural life. Um, and so the other day I was interviewed for a uh, website where they wanted to know, um, do you have to put down how many words per minute? that you can type. And I thought, really? <laughs> That's a question. And we, we researched it. And obviously, if you're a court stenographer, you better know how to type. But most other jobs, the assumption is that you not only can type, but that you know how to use various, uh, various software, that it's just part of who you are. Uh, and um, I thought it was an interesting question. So you know, uh, how do you make a transition? Where are you starting from? Be honest with yourself. What are the skills you have? Do you have technical skills? Do you have credentials? Do you have people skills? Um, you know, start looking at uh, job descriptions and see what things you do have or what things you can say, well, I haven't done that, but I've done this and it's just the same thing. So uh, while it depends, uh, also take a look and evaluate where you're starting from and totally agree with Josh about don't be afraid to do volunteer work. You know, develop your plan B while you're in plan A. Well, honestly, I mean, not just volunteer work because you can, that does work, but usually if you take initiative to start something, a CEO round table, if you know, the, if you know enough people, uh, a, an online panel like this, it's actually easier now during the pandemic to make panels like this than it used to be before. But something where you show initiative will show more than if you respond to someone else's <laughs> initiative. Right. They, people want initiative. People want creativity. People want innovation. Those are the three things that I'm finding are best uh, demonstrated. Uh, so I'll, I'll give a theoretical and practical answer. So one thing I find is that when someone wants to change careers or change directions, they really don't understand what direction they want to go. And they really haven't thought it through. Um, they don't have the mental capacity or they haven't developed the mental capacity to see what is possible. So a lot of us probably know the, the uh, Napoleon Hill book, Think and Grow Rich. So it's a fantastic book to get your mindset around the idea that you can do something and it gives you the confidence that you can actually change. So I think the basic mindset you have to begin with is very important. The practical argument is, is that I deal with a lot of Wall Streeters who don't want to change jobs because they're going to drop, they're going to have a drop in compensation. Yes, they will have a drop in compensation. So uh, sometimes I get into a discussion with clients about how they can reduce their cost base. Do the kids really have to be in private school in Manhattan? Um, inevitably, when you change fields, I will say my experience is your comp goes way down. Um, it could go way up eventually, but the, the, the initial move, I find clients take a, a dip down in compensation. They have to understand that, and to the extent they have to uh, readjust their life in terms of their expense base, then that's something that they, uh, that they have to do. Mm, that's good practical advice. That's very good, right. Uh, but I do find a lot of Wall Street people now are saying, I'm tired of making rich people rich. I want to do something that has more meaning uh, so that they can't only look at the uh, zeros after their compensation, but also other values that they have. How about um, some advice for um, folks who just joined the workforce during the pandemic? Um, how do they get feedback in a virtual world? How do they know um, how they're doing and, and whether they should stay or go or, or ask for more responsibility or wages? Well, when I think about getting feedback, the, I have to say the first thing that comes to mind is giving feedback whether you wanna give feedback up or down or laterally within the organizational chart. I mean, the first thing that came to mind when I thought of that was I have a client who's a venture capitalist and his company, um, a company he led the investment round on went public, big deal in the papers. Uh, everyone made a lot of money, everyone was very happy. And I said, and he had to put together like 40 different people to make sure that um, this one deal went through. And I said, are you thanking them? And he, it didn't occur to him that because he's like, I put it together. And so I said, make sure you go to each of them and bring them in and, and connect with them because that's how you get feedback is to give feedback. And he said, but I don't have time for all of them. And I said, I know you don't have time. Uh, but in today you can write them and say, um, the deal went down is great. It's crazy right now, but let's get in touch maybe next month and make sure that you are making it easy for others. Is it necessarily the case that if you give feedback to others that others will learn to give more feedback to you? 
not necessarily within the organization it may work, but you will develop the skills of what it's like on the other side of how sometimes it's difficult to give feedback to people. Uh, sometimes it's, it's, you know, if you have to give someone some in, uh, negative feedback, I might say, um, what are the challenges in the other person giving it to you so that you can make it easier for them to give it to you? So that's a lot of social and emotional skills of making someone feel that they won't be judged if they share something with you. Mm. Uh, judgment is one I'm of the sorry. worst things to communicate if you want to get feedback back because it's very mm -hmm. difficult. So speaking with support, non-judgment, things like that, it's, it's social skills. Mike, do you want to go next or would you like me to? Oh, sure. Now, uh, you started talking to us, why don't you go? <laughs> Uh, well, what I was thinking about is, to be sure, the experience that I have is that people have to join organizations that they feel will uh, take care of this. They want to know on their interviewing process, you know, when they've been offered the job, what, uh, what kind of meetings do we have? Uh, does it, uh, do people ever get together just to have lunch? Uh, are there virtual rooms where people just, I, I have some people now who they're in virtual rooms together, not to have a meeting, but just to have the idea that they're with a virtual people, other people. Uh, so a lot has to do with the culture of the company and you want to check that out early on so that we are uh, going to be meeting with whoever is giving you feedback and your team. Uh, and if it's not there, you can use the initiative of saying, this is something that I think is really important uh, and uh, is there some way that we can uh, create that? Uh, so a lot depends on the, uh, it depends, the culture of the company. Is it a company that, it, that you're going to want to be a part of? Are they going to care about you? I've had lots of clients who left perfectly good jobs because the culture was so uh, unsupportive, especially for beginners. So, you know, what is the onboarding process that they have so that you have lunch with somebody, or even if it's a virtual lunch, a lot of virtual lunches, a lot of virtual coffees, you know, things like that. You wanna be sure before you join that that's in place. So then it's natural for you to get feedback and support to do an even better job. So uh, thank you, Judith. So I will go back to mindset again. So too many people take a passive approach to their job or their job search process. So if you're young, you have to understand that you're the only one that actually cares about your career. Yes, your parents and your blah, blah, blah. If you think that your employer really cares about your career at the end of the day, I would question that. So I think that from a selfish point of view as the young person, you must expect that you're the one responsible for your career. You're the one responsible for asking for feedback quarterly, even if the annual reviews. So I think the young person has to understand they have to take control of the situation and do a lot of the different practical activities that, uh, that have been mentioned on the call today. But it starts off with an attitude that I deserve feedback, I deserve to grow, I deserve to go up in this company or another company. And if the person's not getting that, then that's not the best company for them. Now, whether they should change because of that reason, that's the, that, 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 that's the depend factor. But it, again, it's all mindset. You have, to, the, you have to take control of your career and demand what you want. And if you're not getting it, go somewhere else. Oh, I, and I totally forgot when Mike said practical, it reminded me of, look up the word feed forward. One word, feed forward. It's a pun off of feedback. Uh, it's an exercise that Marshall Goldsmith, who's like the top, one of the top leadership gurus in the world. And if you, so if you look up feed forward, I did a couple of blog posts on it. Marshall did a bunch of them on it. And I can't go into it here, but there's lots of stuff on how to do feed forward. And feed forward is an amazing way to get the equivalent of feedback, but in a much more, it makes it very easy for the other person to give it to you. And then practice it with a couple friends first, and then you can do it with your boss. So feed forward, Marshall Goldsmith, or my blog post too. So those are all really wonderful um, suggestions. And um, uh, another sort of, overarching question is, what are some of the trends that are here to stay? And what are some of the trends to avoid? Um, 
I know that, um, for example, digital resumes and people creating their own personal landing pages have been sort of, maybe folks have more time on their hands because it's, um, you know, COVID, mm -hmm. but what are some of the trends that you have all been seeing? Well, as I said earlier, one of the trends is innovation and finding out ways of doing things that even if they're not exactly on your job, they can be useful to you in talking to people. I was thinking about, I had someone who had been uh, underemployed on the West Coast and uh, as just a project to keep herself busy, she got together with a group of artists to create billboards so that people in uh, less advantaged communities would participate in the census bureau taking. And it was a really creative project and she didn't have anything on it, on her resume, on her LinkedIn profile, nowhere. But as soon as she started talking to people who would be interested in that, I think that's the big, uh, the big thing. You wanna find places that you're gonna, uh, that people are gonna be interested in who you really are. So when you start doing something because it interests you, or I have one client who um, on his honeymoon, he created this amazing book with so much information. And as he started um, talking on the bottom of his resume, he talked about special interests and his whole interest in how he organized travel. It gave somebody a sense of his ability to think innovatively, to think creatively, to think out of the box. So I would say that, uh, you know, that's one thing. And then the other thing is of course, keep your credentials up, you know, uh, see, <laughs> even if you're not looking for a job actively right now, see what are, what are the, you know, what are the job descriptions that are uh, appearing in areas that you think you might be interested in and have you develop the, the credentials and the skills. And I also wanna un underline what I think both Josh and Mike said, which is that you have to, um, one of the things that you need now is people skills. That if you start looking you know, everything says I'm an independent uh, contributor and I'm a great team player. <laughs> That's one of the things that you see all the time. Um, and, uh, you know, you if you are uncomfortable, like I have dealt, I deal with the whole person because I'm also a New York State licensed mental health counselor, you know, so that if people are uh, feeling that I'm always anxious when I have to give a talk, there are ways of managing to learn how to give a talk so that your anxiety doesn't stop you from taking an opportunity to have a conversation, a meaningful conversation with someone. So I would say you have to be careful which trends you follow and don't follow. So let me describe the trends that I think are bad for job search. Job boards, company websites, applying on job boards or company websites. If you're over the age of 22, I wouldn't touch them. I'm very opinionated and I blog about this all the time. Um, we don't have to go into why here. Call me if you'd like me to know. So I wouldn't go near a job board or a company website, even though 99% of the people think that's how you get a job. Uh, video resumes. They started X number of years ago. They haven't caught on. There's no reason to do them now. Um, there's other trends I see with resumes, especially with the Melissa Meyer resume that came out a few years ago. There's formatting and there's graphics and all this other kind of stuff. If you're in a conservative field, you want to have a conservative looking resume, and the minute you start putting graphics, the minute you start putting images or anything else on a resume, it will not get through the, um, the applicant tracking systems that the HR departments use. So I contradicted myself because I said, don't use the job boards, but my clients still do that because it's candy and I like candy too. But if you're going to use a job board, um, your resume can't have any images or there's a thousand things your resume can't have in order for it to actually get to a human being. So there's a lot of trends you shouldn't follow. I think the one trend you should always follow, which has not changed in the last 10,000 years, is networking. Um, being part of the Columbia Network um, is the most valuable thing anybody on this call has for any purpose whatsoever, especially for getting a job. So there's not as much networking amongst Columbia people when they're searching for jobs. I do work with a lot of Columbia people, and I say, how much have you used the Columbia Network? And inevitably, the answer will be no. And I said, well, that's the single best piece of value you have, now, how you access the network, what you talk to people about, who you want to talk to, those are all the details. But the idea that it's a one-on-one -on -one talk to people, as Josh said, 
and getting behind the scenes because of the connections you have to the Columbia network, that hasn't changed in a thousand years. So job search really hasn't changed. It's still networking, the heart of it at least. Yeah, I'll, I'll speak my mind here too, as Mike did, that uh, there, there's always gonna be a place for resumes that if there's a position on LinkedIn and you have to send your resume and you have to send your resume in. But in my opinion, uh, a resume is a relic of the past. There's ways to, you are online and your presence is online and people can find a whole lot about you. More to the point, you can meet anybody and you can have coffee with anyone in the world. And that is the way to make things happen. If you are offering value to a community, I, I said before, if you wanna switch fields, do something that brings value to that community. If you're in the field that you like, do things that add value to that community. And the more that you show value, the more you'll connect with people. And ideally you'll develop the social emotional skills not to look at people for their position on an organization chart but for who they are as a person. And when you connect with people as a person and you have developed the social and emotional skills to share who you are, partly because it's online, partly because you're connecting with them one-on-one, -on -one, especially if you're not coming to them specifically just like, I wanna get a job at your place or I wanna get a promotion. And you share with them things that you're doing that are adding value to your community, they will start sharing, especially if you've solved problems, they will start sharing their problems with you. And here's my little joke in this situation. There's a technical term in the working world for when a person high up in an organization chart with access to resources shares their problems with you. So I, I guess I can't get the answer, but does anyone know what the technical term is for when a person with lots of resources shares their problems with you? The technical term is job offer. <laughs> if you talk to people and you present yourself as a credible problem solver, not like, hey, I'm a problem solver, but you talk about things that you've done, most of these people, they can't share their problems with people because they know that people are going to be like, oh, let me do that. When you come in and you share that you are doing these things, that you're adding value, they're like, oh, here's someone I can probably tell about this problem of mine. So they might not know that they're offering you a job and you might not know it if you don't know how to respond to it. But if you respond by saying, oh, that's interesting. I think I, I, think I have an idea there. Can I come back to you in a week and share how I think I might be able to add value on that one? then you mm -hmm. have a conversation with them. You have an mm -hmm. ongoing conversation with them and you can keep that going. Mm -hmm. Most job offers, most of the best job offers come from people that you know. It's, I mean, that's always the case. So right. the, developing those social and emotional skills, adding value to communities that you want to be a part of outside the job, also inside the job, if, if you really like where you are. Right, I think what you're talking about, I, I talk now less about networking and more about relationship building, which I think is what Josh is talking about. That, are, are, that it doesn't help if you call somebody, say, I'm looking for a job in your, in your organization if you have no other relationship with them. And uh, you, um, you may need to do some work on your abilities to form relationships, or you may be very, you may have relationships that you haven't thought about. And the thing that's so interesting about this period is that I'm hearing from people that I haven't heard from in a very long time. But it's so natural now to hear from someone that you haven't heard from in a long time. Uh, so it's like starting with, you know, who did you go to school? And certainly the Columbia Network uh, is one of the valuable places, but you can't just be a member of, you have to take on something, take on something you care about through the Columbia Network or tell people what you're doing through the Columbia Network, uh, then uh, you'll find other people that you have affinity for. And it's finding that affinity. I have one client, he always puts his prep school down on his resume, even though he's quite a mature lawyer. Um, and he said, because so many people know him from that era, uh, or they know people who know people, or it's a very particular social group, um, and it works for him. Uh, and it's like, uh, you know, just should everybody put down that they went to PS 77? You know, maybe not. <laughs> but if you have something that you can use to create uh, affinity with someone, what is it that you share? I mean, it used to be that when you walked into someone's office, there would be a picture you could say, oh, I love soccer too, or I have a kid who blah, 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 or you have a dog. <laughs> you know, you used to be able to have those relationships. And right now, mostly people have what uh, Terry has, which is a very interesting background, but it's not where she is, I'm sure. <laughs> unless you do live on the river. <laughs> uh, and so you don't have those things, but there are lots of things so that you, 
you, you, you, you start looking at you know, what you care about, uh, what you've done, who do you have a natural relationship with. Um, and a lot of times, you know, things come from different places. I mean, I have a, a 30 something year old nephew who is not his job, but he was volunteering at a food bank in Brooklyn the Brooklyn people. <laughs> and um, they started giving COVID vaccines to the volunteers. And he wasn't volunteering to get a COVID vaccine, but I can tell you I was very happy <laughs> that he got a COVID vaccine for being the good person that he was. So you never know what kind of reward you're going to get from what you're doing when you care about something. Well, I think this is all great um, advertisement for the Brooklyn and Philadelphia clubs and coming to our events and getting involved in helping plan events because uh, who knows what good can come out of it. Um, I just want to say one other thing about that. You know, a lot of times if you help plan an event, it gives you a reason to get in touch with somebody that you'd like to have on a, that you'd like to get to know because you can invite them to a panel. You can invite them to an event and you might not, that might be the reason that you get to know them. So I think that's really another reason to be really active in an organization. So, so my next question is actually going the other way. I want to know, in this time that we're always connected and on Zooms and the Zooms are all times of day and night, how do we set boundaries when you're trying to make a name for yourself and you're trying to connect? How do you also turn it off? What are your thoughts on that? My thought is that uh, you have to always know how to set boundaries with everyone. And again, it goes, don't work for a company that is not going to be caring about your well-being. Uh, I mean, I have a client who was in financial services and she came to me because she was having uh, panic attacks because people were calling her Saturday night at 1030 at night and wanting her to respond to something they could have done it themselves. But it was that feeling she had and she's one of those terrific people who's part of the responsible rabbit club. So she was used to always doing what was expected of her and the expectations were 24 seven. Well, that, that is not, that didn't work for her. That might work for someone else, you know, who doesn't mind being on 24 seven, but for most people, you know, it's like, be sure that you're working for a company that wants you to stay healthy and well. Uh, and you have to put in boundaries with your family you know, a lot of women are finding that all of a sudden they're the maids and they have to change that. Um, and uh, a lot of people are finding that, um, you know, uh, they have to turn off. I will not be available after 10 p.m. I will not be available after 8 p.m. Or I'm available be until, until 6 and then I'm not available again until 9 because I have a child and I care about my child. So it's really fine. It's really, again, create a culture where that matters, where who you are and your well being matters. Otherwise, don't work for them. There are plenty of other places you can work for. I'll go next. Uh, I would say meditating a half hour a day, virtually every day of the week. If you learn how to meditate properly, you may not do it properly, it's hard. There's no proper way to do it per se. But when you have a, week, a daily meditation practice, and I literally mean daily meditation practice, whether it's connected to religion or not, that's, that's a separate issue. When you have a daily meditation practice that increases your awareness of what's going on in your world, it increases the fact that you may not know that you're, that you're not setting boundaries. I myself don't set good boundaries. I work 60 plus hours a week, um, which is way too much and not healthy for a 55 year old. But the more I've meditated, the more I've realized that I can't keep doing that or else I'm gonna have a heart attack. So self-regulation and meditation gives you, or meditation leading to an understanding of where you're out of balance and leading to maybe putting balance in place or seeking an expert to help you put that balance in place, I think is important. So the first question is, are you, are you out of balance? Where are you out of balance? And I think the meditation is a very, very powerful practice to just make you aware of where you're out of balance. Or maybe you are in balance, or a certain areas of your life are out of balance. Now, I confess that my connection went down for a minute. And when Judith, I saw, I didn't hear the question. When Judith was speaking, I thought it was going to be about uh, setting boundaries. And then Mike, it was about meditation. And I, I'm going to have to punt on this one, 
because uh, I don't know what the question was. <laughs> but maybe the next one. Well, you got the question and Mike was responding to the same question in case you had something to share as well. So it was uh, how to handle when, when you can be contacted anytime, any place. I have to say that the clients that I've worked with have handled it pretty well. I think that, um, I, I, I hope this is not unhelpful for people, but I found that people have been able to communicate. This is when I'm available, this is when I'm not. And uh, it may be because most of my people tend to be more senior and they're able to connect with people and say, this is when I can, this is when I can't. Um, and it's a matter of firmness, uh, planning ahead, being available when you have to, uh, if there's a really crunch time. But I haven't, I confess that I haven't really faced, or my clients haven't really faced serious problems in this area. Uh, I hope if there are people who have faced really big problems and um, um, that wasn't helpful, I apologize. But it's also, we're, we're a year into it. I think people have, my impression is that people have handled it. If, if, if otherwise, please let me know. And maybe if I, maybe that gave some confidence to people that it can be handled, I hope. And you've all shared many, many great insights into um, what I'm hearing and registering as um, the importance of having a sense of self and um, being confident in knowing what you want and how to pursue it. And so the next question is, um, you know, tied into finding the right culture, right? The, the right place to work, the right culture. So what happens when you decide, I want to work for myself and I want to build my own culture or I want to strike it out on my own. What advice do you have for someone who's thinking about doing that? Well, I think people now are starting it as side projects to see if they have the inner resources and the outer connections and, uh, you know, if it's a product, do they have the supply chain and is it a reliable supply chain? I mean, there's some research that people can start with to see if they, um, uh, if they are actually committed to having their own business. Um, and, you know, I suggest that people think of themselves as consultants uh, initially you know, what are the problems, as uh, both Josh and Mike have said, you know, what are the problems that they are, uh, that they're trying to solve? And are they really committed to that? Because running your own business, I mean, I feel very fortunate. Um, my business kind of evolved over time. Um, I was teaching, I was having individual clients. Um, I worked with a woman who did a program called the Women's Selling Game, How to Sell Yourself and Anything Else. And she started introducing me as a career counselor and let me use her office at night. So what are the resources that you can draw on and who can you initially informally or formally partner with? I set up an advisory board every time I, when I was doing organizational development, I was working as a fashion company. So I had a friend who was working in a, who knew the fashion business better than I did. So she became part of my advisory board, formal and informal. So you wanna see what real resources you have and then try it out, try out one project on this, uh, as your, uh, you have your day job and then you have your side bit par, your sidebar and then see, you know, see if you really are committed to it because it takes, um, while we don't have to all work 24 seven, I feel very lucky because I find each day is very interesting. I mean, I'm a curious person and I'm a creative. So I always learn something from my clients and I tell them it's my goal to learn something new every day. And I'm working in a business where I can do that. So is there a, a problem that you wanna solve that you care enough about? And is the circumstances going to be that you have the, you can develop <clears throat> relationships, resources uh, and passion? Uh, I'll throw in self-honesty. So um, when I was working at Wall Street, I tried to start a company making salad dressing. I, I knew nothing about salad dressing. Um, <laughs> I tried to start a few of the, uh, well, I, except for my salad. <laughs> you so are I tried to start a number of companies. <laughs> <laughs> so I tried to start a number of different businesses over time and they were sort of doomed to begin with because I didn't really understand what my strengths and weaknesses were at least with respect to potentially doing something entrepreneurial. So you have to be honest with yourself because we won't make a political, well, 
I'll try not to make a political statement, but you can convince yourself of anything, um, depending upon your mindset. So you have to be honest with yourself. So when I thought about becoming a career coach about five years ago, to me, it made sense because I had helped people with resumes and I'd helped people with different aspects of job search over time. And I knew I liked it. And I bounced it off to some friends and they're like, oh, yeah, yeah, you helped me with your resume when you were, you know, when we were all at Penn or all at Columbia together. So I thought about it and said, well, okay, people give me accolades. I kind of like doing it. Um, can I make a living at it? That's another story. But I, I was enough, critical, self-critical enough to know that I think I could do it. I think too many people convince themselves they can do something they can't. And that's why if you go back and read the Napoleon Hill book, as I mentioned, Think and Grow Rich, um, what he also talks about is is having a, a mentor group or a mastermind group. It's amazing that expression was popular in the 30s and now it's popular today. So you have to you have to get outside feedback from people, but you've got to be honest with yourself. If you know nothing about the salad industry business, you are probably not going to succeed unless you get somebody who really knows something about the salad industry business and you do whatever aspect of the business you can do. So I think the main message is you have to take an, in an internal inventory and not fool yourself. So to answer the question, I, I, the, the book that I wrote, Initiative, is exactly to answer the question that you asked. And uh, I'm not trying to sell it if we're all alumni here. So if anyone wants a copy, contact me and uh, if you don't want to buy it. And uh, it, I mean, it's 10 steps that if you follow them, you will get offers, which could be stepping out on your own, could be starting off your own for-profit. It could be getting promoted. It could be getting a new responsibility at work. Uh, but taking initiative, if there's one thing that I could say to start off with is a lot of people think they start in what I call the solution space. Here, I'm gonna create something so good and so useful, people will have to take it. They'll say, oh, this is exactly what I want. But when you do it that way, when you say, here's something that I'm, it's so good, People are like, oh, yeah, well, I'll be the judge of that. Prove it to me how good it is. And then when you do and you say how great it is, then they say, okay, let me check the competition. The flip side from the problem space, uh, from the solution space is the problem space. Talk to people about what their problems are. Understand what's missing. And as, as I think um, Mike said, know what is interesting to you first. Don't go into, I mean, know what you care about, a field that you want to go into, and then learn in that field what the problems are and talk to people so that they share their problems with you. And then if you get them talking enough and you say, what about this, what about that? Eventually one of them will say, that sounds like a really good idea. And then you say, well, how can I improve it? So if you really want step-by-step, -step, check out the book, but get in the mindset of making people feel comfortable sharing what their problems are with you so that when they share them with you, you can come with, with solutions for them. Great. Um, so I've got a um, question from the audience, but I'll, I'll also give a plug. Patty sent out a chat saying, um, please, please, if you have questions for the career coaches, put them in the chat and we will try to get to them all. But I've got the first one here, which is, have any of you dealt with a client um, or friend who's had a, a very large, long gap in work history, um, upwards of 20 years? And what are your thoughts there? Well, I certainly have, uh, because I've worked with a lot of women who have taken time off to raise families. Uh, and then when I uh, get into the conversation with them, I find out that they were president of the PTA, or they uh, had five children, which means that they have extraordinary ma uh, project management skills, because otherwise you couldn't get that, you couldn't do that. And that they have a lot of underlying skills that things that they haven't done. And then also, they also know a lot of people that they haven't thought about having conversations of possibility with. Conversations of possibility of, at that point is very useful and helpful. Or, you know, I had one client who was in between things and a friend of theirs from their religious organization had a brother who was looking for exactly the kind of skills that that person had. And because there was a relationship because of the community, uh, the person was willing to talk to them and get them started. So again, uh, you know, it's it's looking at what you've actually been doing and what are your underlying skills so you feel confident. I do an exercise about a success chart 
And I find out lots of times people have so many wonder skills and talents that they are not focused on because what they're focused on is I have a gap in my resume. You know, uh, and nowadays, as uh, someone said earlier, um, <laughs> a resume is a selling piece. It's not everything about you. And it's creating your presence in other ways uh, and with other people and relationship building, relationship building, relationship building and learning that skill. I only had one client who took, he was off for a couple of years. He had sold a business and so didn't really need to make money for a while. And then when he came back, he, he, he would have to work eventually. So he came back after traveling the world. And you might think, oh, well, that's such a great thing to say. You know, you sold a business, but it actually doesn't necessarily present you as that great a person to hire because you were running the business before. Uh, so he, when he got back, he did two things. One was he volunteered at an organization that he was interested in. The other was he just took a job and it was not for great pay. It was not a great job, but he wanted to get himself back into things and just get talking to people and, and um, getting back in. And so he wasn't proud of the other job. It wasn't a great job, but it gave him time. It gave him connections. Uh, ultimately, he, ultimately, he took a job working directly with the, the high-level staff at uh, the executives at a, at a small startup. And he was very happy there. But it was the, that transition period of not being sitting at home doing nothing. The volunteering wasn't making any money. The other job wasn't really great. But it got him back into the swing of things. Um, there was another thing that I was going to, oh yeah, uh, about what Judith said about resumes. Uh, this is a comment I, I should have said earlier, but a resume can get you a final no, but it can never get you a final yes. That's one of the things I, that it's, but sure, send them out if the only way you can get to a place is through a resume, if it's on LinkedIn or something like that. But if you can meet someone directly, I recommend not sending the resume if you can avoid it, because why get a no if it might've been a yes later? Mm. Right, because seeing who you know in an organization and contacting them before you even, you know, you find out enough about the organization to find out what should be your selling piece. Should you have a one pager or should you have a, uh, you know, I think the best thing is if you want to work somewhere, find somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody. It's rule of three, not the rule of six. <laughs> I would also add close the skills gap if there is one and there probably is one given the picture that you just painted the certification business is a multi I don't know if it's trillion yet but it's a multi-billion dollar business business there are some certifications that actually really are good and some certifications that are kind of baloney but if you want to go into any kind of an Analyst, if you want to go into anything with numbers, if you don't have, if you don't know Python, if you don't know SQL, then you got to learn it. Knowing Excel and VBA, that's 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 boring. So, if you figure out what you want to do, you have to figure out where your skill gaps are. If you have skill gaps, and you got to figure out how to close those skill gaps in a timely and non incredibly expensive way. Um, so I know Columbia has a lot of great programs that are online, um, and there's other. Udemy and Coursera, Coursera being probably a lot better. Um, but there's so many ways to close gaps through certifications that that might be the way to go. But the concept is close the gap, whether it's through a certification or maybe your industry requires something else, you got to close the gap or else you're just swimming upstream. Right. And I had a client who wanted to change fields and he was taking a class at General Assembly. And in the class was someone who was looking for someone just like him. <laughs> he, was from what, he was in a different field, but the guy got to know him and he could tell that he would be useful and helpful. Uh, so you never know who's gonna be sitting next to you uh, or on the Zoom with you or at a conference with you. You know, there's so many ways of meeting people now and that makes a huge difference. Wonderful responses. And we do have another question. This one says, um, I'm in the midst of an interview process for a dream opportunity and waiting for next steps. I was told to wait until next week for a second interview offer. If I don't hear back by next week, how should I follow up? What language should I use in my email? It's gonna depend a lot on the details of, of the people, but my gut is I start emails with, is it too soon to check back, blah, blah, blah. 
I think it's a polite, simple way to say, you know, is it too soon to check back about the next time we're going to talk? Is it too soon to check back of how things are going? I find that a friendly way to say, hey, what's going on? Right. Right. Just checking in uh, is always a good uh, way to ask someone. Uh, and I know that I had um, recently, I had a client who he had, he had gotten through a lot of uh, relationship building. He had gotten to know a lot of people in an organization. Uh, he applied for something. They said they were interested and then he didn't hear from them and it went blank. And I, he was, you know, like a lot of people, you don't want to call to ask with a no because you're fearful and you'd rather stay in maybe land, which is not the good land to be in. So I finally convinced him to call somebody and they had lost his application. It had somehow gotten lost. <laughs> and they were so happy he got in touch with them because uh, he now has the position. <laughs> and, um, you know, however you follow up, 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 follow up. You know, find a way that works for you, that works, you know, obviously it's quite different if you're talking to uh, a law firm than if you're talking to a startup. Uh, you know, you have, you know, it's, uh, uh, and as someone said, you know, it's like the typeface. If you're applying for a law firm or a bank, you want to have one kind of typeface, you know, and if you're talk calling a more informal organization, you can be more informal. And hopefully you also have, have reached out and created relationships with other people in the organization so they can also help you follow up, follow up, follow up, rule number one. <laughs> So I'm not going to repeat whatever I'm not going to repeat my colleague just said, but I agree. But there's something you can do in the meantime, which is I would take everybody that you met in the first interview and everyone who you potentially could meet in the second interview, although you may not know who they are. And um, I would immediately look them up on LinkedIn, see if they are posting and comment on their posts, repur repurpose their posts or whatever the right word is, reshare their posts. Every platform's got a different word. So. If you can keep in, in addition to in addition to the phone call, I'm not saying it's a substitute, but to the extent that you can follow people on LinkedIn, and that's really the only appropriate mechanism to follow people on a platform, in my opinion. But to the extent that people have um, posted anything, and you can comment on the post, you can reshare their post, you can do something else. The person's going to get a, no, a notification that you have actually commented on their post, and if your comment on their post is a question you almost force them to respond back to your question. As long as it's an intelligent question, you mm. just create a little bit of a social media dialogue. So mm. not, only are you not only are you interacting with them on a non-job search basis, but you're also increasing their social capital, meaning the more people who interact with your post, the more that LinkedIn will send it to more people. Whether LinkedIn, whether people know that or not, they don't know, but people know that, hey, if people interact with my post, that's generally a good thing. So the idea is put the pressure on but in a more subtle way. Well, relationship building. If you're commenting on something someone has posted, I mean, I found that that was a really good thing. I've had, I had a client who was a professor of English and uh, he wanted to be in financial services. And we finally got him into financial services in 2007. And guess who was the first person mm -hmm. hired in 2008? And he started commenting on Money Magazine's articles and Fortune Magazine's article, and someone from the uh, from the uh, someone from the Wall Street Journal saw that and saw his writing and interviewed him, and he got a job with the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> so you never know how things are going to work out. <laughs> well, in the interest of time, um, we have one last question, um, and this one asks. Um, if you have too many interests and couldn't figure out the career path for a long time, what might be some um, advice you can give to, for, for, for um, the question seeker to uh, gain some clarity? Too many interests means that you don't know your priorities. Uh, when you don't know your priorities, everything's interesting. And it's difficult at the beginning to tell the difference between what's some shiny object that I'll be interested in for a little bit, uh, but will fade after a bit versus something that I'll be interested in for years or even decades. The way to learn your priorities. One way is to reflect. Here's what something that doesn't really work is to get some, um, I mean, if you, have, if you enjoy filling out questionnaires online to find out what your thing is, do it for fun. Uh, meditating and reflecting is kind of helpful, but really doing something and finding out 
how you like it when you get into it. Do you like the people in the field? Do you like the kind of work that it is? Almost always because there are many more things that are kind of interesting for any one person than could be really great passions. Almost always the first couple of things you work on are not going to be great life passions. Know that going in. So you're going to test the waters in a couple of different areas. Try something out. See if you can get a little project going. See if you can start an online panel like this in an area. See the types of people you work with. As you meet the people, as you develop the skills relevant to that area, you will find that you'll become more and more sensitive to what you care about. And if you start working in an area and you think, this is, I love it, great. You got lucky the first time. Keep going with it. If not, what will happen, no matter, even if, say you pick the wrong field, it's something that is really kind of thought, you, you thought it might be interesting, but it's not that interesting. As you work on it, you'll start feeling, if I keep doing this, I'm not really going to like what it is. But you'll you also develop the skills of starting things. And then you'll start becoming more sensitive to what you could really succeed at. And things that you didn't realize at the beginning will start to become or lower. Things that didn't seem high priorities at the beginning will only gain in interest. And there's no harm if you started doing a project in one area and you realize that's not the area for you to switch to another. And the more that you keep doing the things that you care about, the more that you'll become more sensitive to the things that you care about more. And eventually, you will stop, you, you'll lose patience for the things that at the beginning you thought might be interesting, but aren't really that interesting. And you'll start working on things that become great life passions. You have to do stuff. You have to start the panels, talk to the people, get the CEOs together, write the articles, start the podcast. A lot of these things don't take much time or money, but they return relationships and they develop in you a sense of what you care about most. And then you know what your priorities are. And then you don't have, you know, no parent is ever like, oh, all kids are equal. Like, I love my child as much as, as other children as much. They're all beautiful. They're all adorable. But yours is special to you. When you work on something, it becomes special to you. And, you, and you, you'll know from experience. Wow. So that's wonderful. Uh, and sometimes it's a matter of doing the old pedal exercise, you know, you put you start making a daisy and you put the things that you're interested in and you start seeing where they overlap. You know, I was interested in art and everyone my whole life said you should be a therapist or you should work with people or whatever. I didn't know what that meant when I was 17 years old. Um, but as soon as I found art therapy, it was like a, a light went off. That's what I should do. And I did that until, you know, I got curious about something else. And then I had these underlying skills of coaching and counseling and degrees and such credentials. And I could take that and bring this to the next place. Um, so sometimes the pedals do work. They give you a sense of this overlaps with that. I could do this thing. Uh, and sometimes they don't. Um, and I totally agree uh, with, uh, with Josh that you know, you start doing something sometimes with, I had a client who um, loved music and was doing a lot of DJing and learning the whole thing about DJing. And he also had a whole bunch of degrees about outdoor living and, and took people on trips and things like that, you know, the great outdoors. Um, and so I said, let's take one for a month, try out for a month, see if you want to do this for a month and see what you wind up seeing about it. Um, and he wound up feeling that the music business was a love of his, but he didn't like the business. <laughs> so give yourself a project for a month and see what comes out. Right. In, the interest of in the interest of time, I have nothing incremental to, to add. You're generous. <laughs> Tough. Well, it's been really wonderful to gain so much insight and to see um, Oh, Judith, did you want to I add do. something? I do, uh, because you asked us, uh, one of the questions you had given us was about LinkedIn. So I had my assistant create a whole cheat sheet about LinkedIn. And if anybody wants any, they can reach her at judith.gerberg, the baby food with a G on the end, dot com. And she will send you my cheat sheet <laughs> on LinkedIn since we didn't get to talk about it. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you so much. And I, I want to say that... Uh, it's been wonderful sharing this time with you and learning so much from you know the demonstrated passion that you all have for what you do. So we are putting into the chat um, 
links to um, get in touch with you if anybody in the audience has um, further questions or would like to work with you. And um, with that said, on behalf of Columbia Alumni Association, Patty and Alyssa, who are here with us tonight, and my counterpart, Matthew Cooper um, at the uh, Philadelphia Club, um, we are so grateful to have you share your insights and to be so uh, such wonderful members of our community. And thank you for sharing your time. Thank you for organizing. Yes. And thank you, everyone, for attending. Right, it's wonderful. And I'm sorry we didn't get to speak to more people individually, but feel free to contact us, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Patty.